How will we address the climate crisis? Climate One with Greg Dalton brings together advocates, influencers, and policymakers in empowering conversations that connect all aspects of the climate emergency, the individual and the systemic, the scary and the exciting, to help you understand the most critical issue of our time. Because addressing the climate crisis begins by talking about it. Beyond his position as chairman of the venture capital firm Kleiner Perkins, John Doerr rose to global prominence in the business world with his development of OKRs, Objectives and Key Results, which he popularized in his best-selling book, Measure What Matters. Could some of the same management tools be applied to preventing the growing climate crisis? In a new book, Speed and Scale, John Doerr and Kleiner Perkins advisor Ryan Panchatsaram argue that it can. An action plan for solving our climate crisis now, today on Climate One. John, in 2006, you hosted a dinner after screening of an inconvenient truth, and you went around the table for everyone's reaction, and your then 15-year-old daughter Mary said she was scared and angry, and added, Dad, your generation created this problem, you better fix it. Shortly thereafter, you gave a TED Talk and did something highly unusual for a hard-nosed Silicon Valley venture capitalist. I can't wait to see what we Tedsters do about this crisis. And I really, really hope that we multiply all of our energy, all of our talent, and all of our influence to solve this problem. <clears throat> because if we do, I can look forward <clears throat> to the conversation I'm gonna have with my daughter in 20 years. So how does it feel to watch yourself get choked up on the TED stage 10 years after that, John? Well, I, I didn't plan that. And right now it feels like I didn't use the last 20 years effectively enough because for all of the opportunity and innovation and clarity that we have around this crisis, what we're doing is not enough. It's not nearly enough. And so we need greater urgency, greater ambition. And uh, I've had a conversation with my daughter, Mary, since, since the book's come out. And I've asked her what she thinks about it. And uh, she thinks the book's good. But the problem, she's still angry about. And I think we're not going to be able to rely on our generation alone to solve this problem. We're going to need hers because it's her future and Greta's future. And I think the anger of impassioned youth gives uh, my heart great hope for our ability to end up with a habitable planet. That uh, resonates a lot. Thank you for sharing that and for uh, you know be, you know crying on the TED stage. I cried after I went to the Arctic in 2007, which inspired me to create Climate One. Um, and it's 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 quite moving on the f uh, wall in my office. I have a father with two children on his knee and they're and they're underwater and they're saying, Daddy, what did you doing the climate? What did you do during the climate wars? Ryan, I wonder if you've ever seen that video. You worked with John a lot. Have you ever seen that video before? The, uh, the TED video, of course. I think, you know, when you talk about the clean tech movement, climate tech movement, John's TED talk is uh, a must watch, right? You have the inconvenient truth that sets the stage, but that talk that John did now almost a decade ago really set the tone and call to arms that we need to harness the powers of innovation to go after this. But like John says, that was 10 years ago and we are at today and we've never emitted more than we've ever had, 59 billion tons. And the problem is still staring at us right in the face. And we need to act now and we need to act urgently. 
right? It's, it's mind boggling to think that like half of all the carbon emission, emissions emitted ever have happened in the last 30 years, you know, since Al Gore's first book. John, you talk about, you know, the young next generation having to do it. You know, Greta's response has been, you know, don't patronize the young people, you people in power, you give up power, you did this. You know, she would say that that might be a, a dodge on boomers like us who created this. So I wonder what you think about that in terms of, you know, the people with power have to do more than the, the young people who don't have as much power as we do. I think she's exactly right. I generally find myself agreeing with Greta. She's got a point. <laughs> uh, the people with power, the nations with power, we have to lead. We have to go first. The U.S. is the all-time alpha historic emitter. True, China's the largest right now. But what that means is that we've got to go first to prove that you can decarbonize and to lower the cost for everyone else. And then it's incumbent on the wealthy nations, the US, China, Europe, to fund the energy, the clean energy transition for the developing world. Uh, there's a great issue of climate justice. It's, it's really a recurring theme in this book. And that's because the, uh, the, the white, rich, developed nations of the world uh, are the ones who are suffering the least. It's the developing world as if we know which is suffering the most. And the develop, developing world is least able to do anything about it. I think we've also got to pay attention to justice in the communities uh, in our transition to this. And I think it's the biggest opportunity of our lifetime to a clean energy economy, say by 2030, we'll create 30 million new, new jobs. We'll destroy about 5 million jobs. And in those communities that depend on fossil fuels, we've got to make sure they have their fair share of that new economic opportunity. Well, oil, coal, and gas were mentioned for the first time in an agreement negotiated at a UN climate conference. Kind of hard to believe that oil, coal, and gas were not mentioned in the Paris Accord, uh, but it they is. weren't. And at COP26 in Glasgow, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres opened the meeting by saying essentially that everyone already knows what needs to be done. Let's listen to a bit of that speech. So as we open this much anticipated climate conference, we are still heading for climate disaster. Young people know it. Every country sees it. Small island developing states and other vulnerable ones live it. And for them, failure is not an option. Failure is a death sentence. John, as you just noted, the U.S. is the largest historic emitter of carbon pollution. You know, what moral responsibility do we have for people in developing countries that are being harmed, you know, given that death sentence by our lifestyles? It's, it's an absolute responsibility that we have. And by the way, I don't think we'll be able to solve this problem unless the world rallies together much in the way the world did to the existential threat of World War II. If you remember in the early 1940s, the Axis powers had the allies on the run. The US had not committed to enter the war. Churchill was standing alone in Britain and democracy was on the line. It was existential. And what happened? In four short years, the West stopped making automobiles, stopped making appliances, and turn that manufacturing capability over to making aircraft, battleships, tanks. 268,000 fighter planes were made. And it's relevant to this mission because the whole world mobilized and succeeded in defeating an existential threat. And my book tells the story of plans and how important plans are. And the plan that was written by FDR on a napkin for his General Arnold after a December meeting. And, and he, he wrote down just four key steps that were needed to win the war. Well, we have a, a plan that has six key objectives, and it can allow the world to win the war against this existential crisis. The difference that time in World War II, though, is that there was a human enemy with an intent to inflict harm. This time, it's, you know, the enemy is what, uh, maybe some particular companies, maybe some black 
uh, goo or a rock that we dig out of the ground. You know, it's a little harder to mobilize people when we are, you know, Ryan, we are complicit in this. And in fact, it's actually been a fossil fuel industry tactic to BP popularize the, the personal carbon footprint to put that back on us. So we feel guilty, we, we argue, we judge each other, and we don't have Hitler and Mussolini to rally against. Yeah, we're, we're missing a common enemy, but I think uh, one of the hopes in the plan is to show that the common enemy is our emissions crisis, right? Don't talk about it as this abstract thing. We truly emit a certain amount as individuals, as cities, as states, and we have to go after those sources of emissions, and that's the true enemy. That is the thing we have to turn the tide on. But you're right, the impacts of climate uh, change and the impacts of a warming world take time to be felt. But I think if there's anything different now than five years ago, 10 years ago, is that we're feeling it. We're seeing it. You know, no matter where you live in the world, there is a global weirding that's happening that you can feel at your doorstep. And I think if you listen to the scientists, they say it's going to get weirder and it's going to get worse. And so you have to, we have to act. You're right. And so you know, I'm going to ask uh, John and then Ryan, you know, there's a lot of debate in the climate conversation is what can I do? Yeah, the individual, right? And we all feel inadequate. And, you know, people, I interview lots of very powerful people. They feel inadequate, right? I interviewed Ray Mabus running the U.S. Navy. He's like, I don't have enough. Like, everyone feels just not, you know, minuscule in, in, in proportion to the problem. So what, in your theory of change, you know, what is an individual who's not running a company? You know, is this a kind of a, a, a retail problem or is this something that, that the elites with power have to change? So, John, first, you know, what's the role of individual? individuals in your theory of change? Well, individual action is essential and it's expected. So if you can afford an electric vehicle, buy an electric vehicle. If you can get solar for your home or your, your business, by all means, go do that. But my theory of change, this book is written for the leader inside every reader. People can be leaders from all walks of life. And FDR had this tremendous definition of leadership. He said, leadership is the art of getting others to want to do what must be done. So in addition to a comprehensive OKR-driven plan with objectives, measurable key results, which gives a lot of people great hope, there's a softer part of this book. And that's the story of leaders from all walks of life. Uh, in Virginia, a cross-country track team that teams up with parents to flip that school district into electric buses so they're not running behind diesel buses anymore. Or a company where the employees push the management team to not only make a commitment to net zero, but to meet that commitment. Or some scrappy lawyers who team up with Michael Bloomberg to shut down coal plants all across the US. Every one of these is a story of collective action. And frankly, that's all we have time for now. If we don't move collectively, we will not, we, we, we will not get the job done. Ryan, you were recently on the board of, of Amaris, a company that was biofuels and kind of pivoted to cosmetics, you know, smaller volume, higher margin, makes sense. You know, what's your takeaway from you know, trying to go after big oil and companies like, oh, you know, they're big, they're powerful. And let's face it, you know, there's a lot of energy density in gasoline and fossil fuels that it, it serves us very well. Yeah, there, you know, when you talk about the incumbents, just to, to pick on that for a sec as well, too, of the 59 billion tons of emissions, they're someone else's business model. And it's up to us to come up with alternatives. And so when we pick on oil in particular, I think one of the lessons that we drew from Kleiner's experience and the world's experience is when crafting our innovation key results, they're all tied to cost, right? You know, for if, whether it's carbon removal or new batteries or hydrogen, cost is going to be king in the markets, right? The uh, Bill Gates has a great term for this. It's called the green premium, right? That's the added cost of the cleaner, greener version. And when the green premium hits zero, right, and inverts into a discount, well, you can't stop the market forces. You know, when you look at the Paris Agreement from five years ago to Glasgow, you know, solar and wind was more expensive when Paris was signed. Barely any capital was going out into new clean tech ventures. You walked into Glasgow with solar and wind being finally cheaper than gas and oil and coal. 
And not just that, you had almost close to $35 billion going into new kinds of companies. We are in a new era. This transition is happening now, but we really need to look at the markets as truly an accelerant, Greg. And, and the difference with electricity is that, you know, that's a, is a highly fragmented, what is there, something like 3,000 utilities uh, in, the, in the United States. You know, oil, liquid transportation fuel is a lot more concentrated. You know, there's state oil companies, there's investor-owned oil companies. Yeah, there's wildcatters. It's, it's not just, you know, Chevron and Exxon and BP. There's more than that. But what's your role, what's your approach, John, to the, you know, working with incumbents or, you know, isolating them and trying to, you know, marginalize them? I, th I think we work with incumbents, but we do that with a clear view of what they've done in the past. The past is the past. The carbon that was emitted will be in our atmosphere for centuries to come. But I think that I want to get all the world's organizations and resources to find a way to invest in and accelerate this new clean energy future. John, Silicon Valley has typically asked for a few things of, of government, you know, fund basic research, provide us an educated workforce, support free trade, you know, protect the carried interest loophole, you know, get out of the way of everything else. Um, you know, has this, you know, the climate urgency, has it changed? You said government's, you know, lagging partly because it's being <laughs> slowed down by industry. Has this climate work changed your view of the role of government? Uh, it, it's taught me the lesson that government is more important than ever before. And government, it's hard for government to get ahead of the body politic for political leaders to move much further than their voter base. And so key result 8.1, turning movements into action, is to have the climate crisis, Greg, be a top two voting issue in the 20 top emitting countries by 2025. By 2025, that's just three years from now. Climate is not a top two voting issue in the United States. It's not a top two issue in India. It's not a top two issue in China. It is in Europe. And we have a 15-year-old Swedish teen, Greta Thunberg, to, to thank for that. In 2018, she was a lone student staging strikes on Fridays in front of the Swedish parliament. By 2019, as you know, she catalyzed a worldwide demonstration of some 8 million climate, largely youth, who were aggrieved. And, and, and so we need measurable action plans to cause that to occur again and again and again. If we don't turn movements into action, if they remain just protests, I don't think we'll succeed. Right. And that's, you know, certainly something that, that companies are doing. Lots of companies, you know, Ryan, are doing uh, net zero pledges, et cetera. How do we know that that's not greenwashing? How do we know that those pledges, which let's be honest, you know, they're made when the CEO who makes them will not be in office. Uh, they'll be retired somewhere yeah. by the time those pledges come true, you know, um, come, come due. You know, what, how much faith should we put in these corporate net zero pledges? You know, when John talks about OKRs, a great key result he'll always say is time bound. It is time bound and measurable. And so, you know, this isn't greenwashing if a company is making a commitment that is happening by 2025, that's happening by 2023 or even 2022, right? So when you think about the commitments being made in 2050, 2040, and in that range, most likely the leaders that are making them are not going to be the CEO. If you really want to believe uh, that action is happening. You got to see the commitments that are being made that are sooner and the true actions that are happening right now, Greg. You know, Greg, in doing the research for this book, I was really struck by the commitment of Doug McMillan of Walmart to more than drive their suppliers and their supply chain to net zero, but to be the world's first regenerative company to set aside millions of acres of forest land millions of, of, of acres of, of ocean for regeneration and restoration. Walmart's a Fortune One company. I mean, it's been at this a long time and it's honest about saying they've got a long way to go. But that kind of leadership, I, I, I wish I saw that in the governments of the world. 
Yeah, and Walmart can can do a lot when they act at scale. Uh, they they can they can certainly have a huge impact. Uh, John, you know, I know that uh, Kleiner Perkins invested in, in Uber early on, and Uber and Lyft. I think it's particularly in the case of Lyft. John Zimmer was very sincere about uh, trying to uh, attack, reduce car ownership, vehicle miles traveled, have a less car dependent society, and that was the vision and the promise that was sold to investors. It was sold uh, to the public, and we know now that ride-hailing services increase congestion. Uh, you know, people drive 100 miles to downtown New York or downtown San Francisco, and they circle around uh, so that we can get them within two or three minutes because we don't want to wait longer than two or three minutes. And that was a, a promise uh, that may have been a business success, but it was not a climate success. So what's to prevent you know, that from happening again with some of these things you're investing in that may be financially successful, but they are not the climate success that they are promised to be in the beginning, as is the case with Uber and Lyft. So uh, the way to achieve climate success is to be really clear and measurable in the climate goals. And in the case of transportation, we call for 50% of the miles driven, not the numbers of vehicles, but the miles driven on the roads are electric by 2040 and 95% by 2050. And to get there, we know how many electric vehicles have to be in the fleet. And as exciting as it is for people to see Tesla be the second or third most valuable company in the world, the truth as you know, Greg, is that only 4% of the world's transportation fleet today is electric. And the internal combustion vehicles that are on the road, whether they're trucks or cars, are gonna be operating for a very long time. This is a tall order. We can do it, but we can only get it done if we're very clear about choosing the right key results. So when you invest in a company, are you going to, and even non-green companies, are you giving them kind of carbon goals uh, as part of the setting up and, and investing in the early stages of these companies? I, I do. And in the Breakthrough Energy Fund, which I'm on the board of together with Bill Gates, a threshold for an investment is that it will, if successful, eliminate a half gigaton of emissions by 2050. So uh, this is possible. If you look at something like Beyond Meat or Impossible Foods, they create a whole new category. Look at the knock-on effect of Tesla on Volkswagen. Volkswagen is now selling more electric vehicles than Tesla is in Europe, but it is a very close race. And I promise you that every auto leader who we've profiled or who cares about their customers and their company has noticed that the market's moving this way. We've got to use capitalism's resources to make this change happen fast. Should we be concerned that EV batteries for the masses require strip mining and rainforest depletion? Uh, Ryan, you're nodding. Take that one. There's a, in the chapter electrified transportation, we talk about the excitement, the shift, how it's so much better, you know, ensuring also clean sources of energy are going to your EVs. We also talk about the challenges and problem with actual mining and where you get it from and the sourcing of it and the labor that goes into it. And well, one, mining practices have to get better, but we also try to highlight uh, a company called Redwood Materials in there too, that's finding ways to take old batteries and recycle them. And so, you know, as we shift from pulling oil and that gunk from the ground, we have to be thoughtful as we pull out these metals and minerals as well too. So no, it's not an ignored problem. It's one that we have to be very conscious of as we make this shift. John, you mentioned, you talk a lot about uh, climate justice. So how did you as a wealthy white man, you know, reflect on your white privilege, privilege that you, um, you have and how do you, um, yeah, how have you changed your thinking on that in the last couple of years? Well, I'm, I'm a very lucky middle-class engineer from St. Louis, Missouri, who benefited from enormous sacrifices and investments that were made in technology and if, if, by the United States. I'm a red-blooded patriotic capitalist. But I think that because of my good fortune, and believe me, I didn't invent Silicon Valley and neither did the people who have prospered from it. I mean, Moore's Law is the greatest gift to human progress that, or one of the greatest that we've ever seen. But I think the, the, the successful entrepreneurs 
are stepping up to the plate to really be constructive in this fight. Bill Gates is now the largest individual investor in clean tech. Bezos committed the world's largest supply chain, Amazon, to net zero by 2040. He's now the world's largest climate philanthropist. $10 billion is, is not small change in the field of climate philanthropy. And Elon Musk is leading the EV revolution. He's pledged $100 million for carbon removal. And I could tell you more stories. Those of us who've been really blessed, who are very fortunate or lucky, uh, I'm, I, I welcome all of these people to, to, to deal with this most wicked of all problems. Yeah, definitely better to have them on on this side than, than on the other side. Ryan, you know, what if you look forward, you know, you're, you know, um, younger, going to be dealing with this <laughs> longer. Um, you know, what what's what gives you hope and what what scares you about this climate future we're going into? It's a great question. I, you know, <clears throat> this will be a generational burden, right? I, I'm a millennial, right? I, I fit in that category and, and we carry the burden of inheriting a world passed on by the boomer generation as well as Gen X. And, you know, it's not supposed to be a burden that paralyzes us, right? It's supposed to be a burden that forces us and pushes us to act, right? You know, when you think about actually, if a millennial is buying a home today, the mortgage that they take, they'll pay it down by 2050. The same time we're supposed to get net zero, like that's to think about the time frame. You know, millennials today are taking on leadership positions in their companies, they're having kids. Every action I think this millennial generation take can change the course of this crisis, but we're not here doing it alone, right? We gotta have millennials teaming up with Gen X and boomers. When you look at, you know, two of, two of the stories in the book, whether it be Elon Musk or Doug McMillan, they both are Gen Xers. Gen Xers leading the way. You've got boomers in the book leading the way. And so I think my reaction to your question is, you know, this is uh, one where generations have to lock arms, uh, one where anger, innovation and action need to all come together. And that's 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 what gives me hope is that this idea that we can work together and that we must. On Climate One today, we've been discussing speed and scale, an action plan for solving our climate crisis now with John Doerr, chairman of the venture capital firm Kleiner Perkins, and Ryan Panchatsaram, an advisor at Kleiner Perkins. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows are available wherever you get your pods. Talking about climate can be hard and difficult, sometimes depressing, and it also can be exciting and illuminating as we've seen today. So please help us get more people talking about climate by giving us a rating or review. I think John Doerr should go in there and give us a rating. Uh, thanks for joining us online. We'll see you next time, everybody.